It's a Tuesday edition here on Zero Block 30, and today we have three rounds of the magazine. Round number one, an article came out detailing the best aerospace inventions in 2022. We're going to let you know if we're impressed or not. Kate is going to hate this round because there's a science. lot of science talk. Yeah, we're going to have some mm. So I think we'll go thumbs up, thumbs down to see if you guys think these inventions are good or if they're not good. Some of them blew my dick off like they're incredible. And I don't know. You know, there's times where I go through like different news articles or different things from like DARPA. I don't know how people's brains work that way where you're going to. Did you guys ever see that one telescope? It's the one before the huge one. But they showed the woman's allegor um, algorithm equation. Yeah, equation yeah. of how she figured out how to look inside a black hole. It's like size 10 font, and it's legitimately like 18 inches thick in this book. How? And she was like, if one single letter or number is off, the entire telescope wouldn't work. And it's like it was thousands of pages long in order to do this. Just nuts, like how people are smart enough. I'm not smart enough to that. Round number two, we don't talk about Finnish soldiers that much, and maybe not ever, but this story about a meth-fueled soldier has nothing to do with the, forts, the folks at Fort Bragg, despite what you might think. Mm. No, no meth. They're not the those. only ones. Nope. Mm. And Army coach Jim Munkin joined nope. us to talk about it. Nope. Ah, I nope. did it on purpose. Just a little goof, and we got the Army head coach. On the week of Army, Navy, Cons is wearing all of his Navy or his Army stuff. He's having a good time. You're all over the place. <laughs> ah, I am. I'm all over the place. It was a long weekend. Foggy. I hate fog. Fog being around just stinks. Like, mm -hmm. you don't know what time of day it is. All the roads are wet. Everybody's honking at everybody. There was like 10 people in line when I was trying to get an Egg McMuffin. This I morning. don't want to hear it from you, San Antonio. <laughs> You oh, think true. you have fog? You think true. you have shitty weather? Oh, wait. You guys no. have a lot of fog in New York? Uh, yeah. We're fog. on the water. True. You are on the water. Good point. I live in a swamp by the in the <laughs> Meadowlands. That is very true. A literal swamp. Yeah, I think oh, you definitely be... get more more fog than, than we do on the river here. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. It's hard oh. to say. All right. Let's get going. Oh, wait. The show is brought to you by our good friends at Whistle Pig. Whistle Pig is delicious. I have these tiny little cubes because I used to go with the big cubes that don't melt. Yeah. But I drink so slowly now when I'm just sipping. On, I really am the definition of a nurser when it comes to mm -hmm. Whistle Pig now. I just like to have one or two as a nightcap um, on a Friday and Saturday night. And it gets me going i watch a little bit of sister wives maybe something else oh. i've been super into white lotus lately that mm -hmm. show's fucking fantastic but none of it is fantastic as our good friends at whistle pig because they have two wonderful piggyback whiskeys that they have it's rye or the bourbon depending on if you like a little spice in your life from the rye or a little sweeter side with the bourbon the bourbon piggyback 100 pursuit bourbon stands taller and bolder than the pack and no other bourbon and rye duo on the market offers this big of age proof and mash for a full send on flavor the piggyback 100 percent rye is the savory side of whiskey while piggyback 100 percent bourbon is the sweeter side of whiskey you really can't have one on your bar without the other and i want to give a shout out to one of our listeners his name is alex he wrote me on uh i think it was saturday night and he said i'm having my first piggyback uh, rye that's whistle pig that i've ever had and i'm doing it in celebration of being my battalion soldier of the year and he said that one of the reasons why he enlisted was because we talk about how much fun that we had when we were in the military <laughs> so he joined the military i couldn't believe that I know, I know. And that's not the first time. I would have thought that like people were like, fuck no, I don't want to do that. But I would say my time in the military was 90% awesome and mm -hmm. the 10% sucks, but everybody wants to talk about the part that sucks. It just stinks that they can't do that about Whistle Pig. There is no bitching about Whistle Pig. It might be the only thing that military members don't bitch about because whenever you taste it, it's delicious. Go get some Whistle Pig at whistlepig.com or just stop by a local shop or at a local uh, bar or wherever you want to go. Just try Whistle Pig. All right, let's get started with the show today. But before we do that, I wanted to tell you <laughs> my kiddo we've been talking about hockey and all the different sports that are going to be around that aren't here when we move to chicago and mccartney was like what's the hockey team name in chicago and i was like well it's the blackhawks and mccartney goes the hawks i can't like the hawks 
I like the Mighty Ducks like, because the Hawks Aww. are the team against yeah. the Mighty Ducks. So they just love anything Mighty Ducks related. They're like, is a they're the Mighty Ducks team? I was like, well, there's the Anaheim Ducks, which is the yeah. team. And they're like, I'm all in on that. Anaheim <laughs> so, Ducks it is. Yeah, Anaheim Ducks it is. The whole squad, let's get into a flying D and just absolutely <laughs> do it. Kate, I'll be Goldberg. You, I'll fart on the ice. Kate, I saw you were out there on the swamp again this weekend or a different trail. It looked like a beautiful time with your son. Oh, yeah, taking him hiking again. He keeps he keeps seeing the pack out, and he's like, he tries to climb in it all week long, so on the weekends I try and get him out in it and take him mm-hmm. for a little hike. Um, with the toddler, it's so hit or miss. We'll go, like, 0.2 miles, and then he's like, out, out, out. And so I set him out in the ground, and then he's like, in, 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 mm-hmm. back in the back. It's like that the entire way. So we don't go far, but I'm like, what else do I have to do? So we just take our sweet time. If we want to look at a log for 30 minutes, buddy, we'll just poke at a log for 30 minutes. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I've learned it's not about the distance there. It's about just, like, yep, just poke, hanging out, poking things with sticks, really. Yeah, that's all you really care <laughs> that's about. That's it. And that's yeah. actually going to come up in round number one, too. Yeah. And, Cons, you went up to Vermont to do a little Pink Whitney house. How was that? Yeah, it was a good time. It's I was saying when we got up there, it, only at Barstool do you find that you will get – paired up with people at the, the company weirdest that's just the weirdest just yeah fucking weirdos. I, I, you know I, I'm, I'm friendly with all of the people some more than others but they're all very nice people and it was a great and time. the age disparity was large. yes yes we have you know clemmer who is actually 40 and then i i think maybe caroline was Probably was the 22 youngest. right uh, 21 22 something like that yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's just a, a hodgepodge of, of people that are thrown together, and it's like, hey, go live in a house all together for a weekend. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you got to get through the dynamics of sharing bathrooms, and you don't really know these people all too well. Toilets, like, what if you get diarrhea? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's just so many <laughs> you factors. You never know. Yeah. So it was a nice time, though. Shout out to Pink Whitney. Uh, heck of a sponsored trip. It was a great time. All right, let's get going with the show today. We have a bunch of, or we only have two stories and then the interview, but these two stories, doozies, especially the second one. I, I meant to, I first one, not, there's no stabbing, no poking trees in the first one. That's round two. Let's okay. get going with round number one, where we're going to talk about the best aerospace inventions of 22. All of these came about this year. This year is the one that came out, but we're going to start the first one. Uh, there was a whole list. Of I the already top... ha- I hate this so much. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a list that came out of the top 100 inventions of 2022. And the only other one that I thought was remotely interesting was a coffin. Kate, tell us a little bit about this. Sure, coffin. chaps, gladly. <laughs> yeah, the loop cocoon. Uh-huh. And loop I know what you're thinking, Kate, that this whole thing is fake. I swear to God, it's not. It, I swear, it's not okay, fake. Okay, the world's first living coffin. It's time to close the loop on the circle of life. Modern burial practices pump heaps of toxic chemicals into the ground and cremation pollutes the air with greenhouse gases. Over the last several years, solutions for greener burials have emerged. California has even given human composting the green light. But for most people- First off, how do we feel about that human composting? I feel like that's no different than getting cremated really, it's just, you being yeah. used for a different purpose and there's probably people who love nature so they're like oh you're gonna put me back into nature so they love it so i don't see it's anything a, wrong with i that. think it's a waste of i think it's a waste of pillows inside the coffin and it's a waste of really nice wood sometimes are those are made of mahogany that's yeah. mm. that's a what? so you're all for human composting i'm sorry but just what throw me in the ground what toxic chemicals go into the ground if you bury someone oh like Buddy, formaldehyde it's in your body like you're yeah. in a body your body's pumped full of that makes um, sense Okay. But for most people, alternatives like that have remained out of reach or even illegal. This year, Dutch company Loop Biotech became the first to offer a living coffin for sale to the general public. The cocoon is made of dried mycelium, which is the cobweb-like filament that forms mushrooms and other fungi. This substance creates a sturdy coffin that breaks down once exposed to moist soil. In less than two months, it degrades entirely and this and seeds the burial site with mushrooms. Mm-hmm. The fungi then helps the corpse biodegrade more quickly, breaking down heavy metals and pollutants in its tissues so it can nourish surrounding plants instead of poisoning them. 
But be careful, if you let it touch soil and then try to move it again, you could be featured on an episode of Coffin Flop and have to spread your blue <laughs> butt cheeks on Corn Cop TV. I know that part is out of my chat. Yeah, that was me. Okay. Um, I, by the way, with the uh, if you're not a I think you should leave fan. Sorry, if you're not a I think you should leave fan, almost any type of dialogue, if you do it in Tim Robinson's voice, is hilarious. Like, yes. I've been doing it even on, like, The Crown. When Prince <laughs> Charles says something, I'll pause it and do the Tim Robinson voice to my wife, and she's like, fucking enough. The show's been <laughs> out two years. Cut I'm ruining really that show for her. <laughs> I really am. All right, I... these are the actual aerospace. I picked their top six. There's, like, 20 of those, and these are all really, really amazing inventions yeah. that are unbelievably smart people have designed. But by the way, I like that mushroom coffin idea. It's like, great. I think it's a really good idea. If you read up on it, we're running out of burial space here That's in the US. That's what I say. Dig them up. Just make Dig a mushroom. Make a mushrooms, man. Um, just a few decades ago, so this one, the Event Horizon Telescope, seeing the black hole in the Milky Way's center. Just a few decades ago, Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at our galaxy's heart, was a hazy concept. Now, thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope, we have a blurry image of it, or since a black hole doesn't let light out, of its surrounding assertion disk. Accretion, right? Oh, accretion disk. The EHT is actually a global network of radio telescopes set st stretching all around the world, essentially. But so we can see then the outer edge. Mm -hmm. You, you can't see our time. galaxy's inner like, butthole, but we can yep. see the spokes. Connor's going down. First up, before we give ups and downs, do you, did you guys ever watch Event Horizon? No. No. Oh, uh, Event Horizon. I don't, I'm not usually a sci-fi guy, but Event Horizon has one of the most disturbing scenes of any movie I've ever seen. Because they, they're going out space travel, and they get mm -hmm. locked in those chambers, you know, that astronauts can go into mm -hmm. and seal it so they don't, if something goes wrong. Well, they had that going on, and there was a guy who was a young guy, young astronaut, first trip to space, he was like 23 years old, and the chief was on the other side of the wall. And in order to keep the mission going, they had to open up the case that the other guy was in, and it creates this pressure vacuum. And so he's standing at this wall of glass, and he can look inside the chief, and he's like, let me out. Let, and his eyes like pop out of his head and like all this shit. I was like 14 when I watched it, and I was like, ah, I'm fucking scared. I don't want to go to bed. Event Horizon, it'll fuck you up, man. That, that movie's Yeah, insane. I have to say, like, I never want to go to space. You could be like, Kate, right? You just got selected that's to go to space. All I'm right, going to say, fuck no, I don't want to go to space. Really? No, like, thank you. Because you like to do all kinds of travel and adventures. I would have thought you'd have been on that plane in a heartbeat or No, and it's that event horizon. I don't want my eyeballs sucked out of my head. <laughs> True. I don't, and like, I okay, it's cool that we're able to see the edge of the center of our galaxy now. Like, that mm. is fucking cool. Mm. But what do we do with that? Like, Exactly. Okay. So a, a smart scientist would sit here and tell you, well, actually, the, the intel we learned from that could help us with that, and it breaks down smaller and smaller until we have some new innovation that actually is useful to us, I know. But I just don't know what the fuck that is. There's going to be one that comes up about that. We'll, we'll table okay. this talk because later on there's going to be one that's very specific okay. but about that. Here's why I'm I'm giving this the thumbs down. I just said. Okay, go ahead. No, go we're ahead. not tabling. i got to get this off okay. now because then we'll get off on another tangent, and I won't get to tell True. you why this is a bunch of malarkey. You just said the one telescope, the woman had, you know, pages of a, a freaking equation that makes sense that basically nobody on this earth. All right. So that's number one. This almost feels like to me, like, you remember those kaleidoscopes you had as a kid where you just spun the end of it and it like shows a bunch of stuff. You could just tape something on the back of this telescope and be like, oh, that's the Milky Way. How am I going to dispute that? Just because you tell me it's the Milky Way, I got to take you at your word. I'm not impressed by this. They, they this is the same argument for the moon landing. Like, I, I, I feel like it's the moon landing on 100. But you're going to see later on in these inventions that you're wrong, cons. And I used to be on right. that same boat, but you're wrong. Like, there is things like that are happening down, in space. It's like trickle-down yeah, trickle economics, down, but trickle-down trickle down science. Trickle-down economics in okay. space. Exactly okay. right. Let's keep going. So, Kate, thumbs up or thumbs down on this one? I, I like to see I'm the I'm going rim. thumbs down on this one. I don't give a fuck about black holes. Black holes are – nothing's going to ever happen. Like, no. that's how you know black holes – 
aren't that cool. Nothing, ever, everything that's going on in the black hole has been going on for fucking oh, billions Oh, I go of down years. Google rabbit holes trying to understand them sometimes, and it's fascinating. I don't fascinating. get it, and maybe that's why, because I'm yeah. too stupid to understand. Like, I don't know, how does, how does things get sucked into the universe, and it go? where does it go? Like, it just goes nowhere? I don't know. Um, no, so it, the pressure inside of it is enough that it could turn the sun into the size of, like, the head of a pin. It's something about pressure and whatever. It's it's the Just center super of gravity. gravity. It's, like, super intense. It's hard to explain, but, like, it's so intense that even light can't escape it, and it could... Yeah, it's it's hard to explain. There's yeah. lots of stuff on this list <laughs> that my brain just cannot understand at all. So we got two. Th- so I guess this is a thumbs down for this one. Yeah, uh, I'm a thumbs up on it. <laughs> all right, Horizon, next. Out. Yeah. Dart by NASA and John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Earthlings who look at the sky in fear that space might space rock might tumble down and devastate our world can breathe a sigh of relief. A 1,100 pound spacecraft streaked into a roughly 525 foot diameter asteroid, intentionally crashing it at over 14,000 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. So we crashed a little rocket into an asteroid. It's NASA- almost like real life Armageddon. No, this is, shout out to Harry Stamper. This is exactly what that is. Yeah. Yeah, it was called uh, DART, and even though it didn't like explode the rock or whatever, it changed the trajectory of the asteroid. So at that far of a distance, if you throw it off even, yeah. Even the tiniest measure possible, by the time it's supposed to get to Earth, it's going on a totally different path. So, yeah, thanks to DART, humans redirected an asteroid for the first time, obviously. And this, and this happens because of the other things, that we know more about space travel. We know how to yes. get things accurately on target. So it could end up something like that. I read that this 14,000-pound explosion, if that doesn't happen, this asteroid on its way to Earth is big enough if it landed anywhere on Earth, especially in the water, that it would create such a big wave that it would wipe out all of North America. Well, then I guess you guys thumbs up it. No, it's just... Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to thumbs down thumbs it out of spite. No. Oh, okay. Wow. okay. I think this mm. one's got to be unique. We, we're I'm live. I'm giving it two kid. thumbs up. Two thumbs up, because this wow. is awesome. This yeah. is Dang. awesome. But that doesn't thing. happen without the other stuff. It's like a slip... It, everything gets... It's like a rubber band mm. ball. One rubber band ain't shit, but together they create it a ball. It all comes trickling down. Yeah, uh, exactly all right, right, next up. Black Hawk helicopters that fly themselves. Mm -hmm. So normally two pilots sit up front of a Black Hawk, an Army Black Hawk helicopter, but what if that number could be zero for super hazardous missions? That's exactly what the UH-60 helicopter can do. Product of our pals over at DARPA. You're right. Uh, we got to I feel like they hate us. I feel they, like DARPA oh, hates us. Do. And it all stems down to Colonel Rob, uh, Bob Dole. We Rest thought he was had passed away and he had But now yet. he has, yeah. And now he has. Anyway, they corrected us on Twitter, for those who don't remember. (laughs) DARPA got mad. Anyway, um, so it can carry 2,600 pounds of load underneath it. Just of load underneath it. Just Uh, Sounds like (laughs) Owen Gray to me, folks. Yeah. The technology comes from helicopter makers Sikorsky and allows modified Blackhawks to be flown by two pilots, one or zero. That's basically for this one. It's unmanned Blackhawk pilots. What do we think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm thumbs yeah. in the middle because here's okay. why. Because I understand these where damn the helicopters is. flying over the border taking our jobs. Yeah. Um, no, actually, what I was gonna say was, I just think there are, there are things, like for instance, when when Sully landed that plane on the Hudson. You mm-hmm. can't do that with a, 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 um, a robot. I think. I think it's gonna be. There's not gonna be people in it. No, I know that's what I'm saying. I think right. certain so, things you need human instinct to take over, and I think you eliminate that when you're just strictly robots. So maybe it's okay if there's only one, but I think you need a human body in there because when you lose the human element, I think you're asking for things to go wrong. But I think with these that you're going to have such accurate controls, like that drone that flew through the Barstool office. It started up there, went through the stairs, and it flies all around, and it goes mm-hmm. crazy. It could go right in front of your face. Like, the way that they can control these things is just so different now. I feel like this could be great. Like, in missions where you're going, like, so many of those Vietnam missions, if you could drop down and pick people up and take them without a pilot, I mean, that's pretty ideal. Which is, I think, where eventually it's going to be headed. And I think, like, 
Mm-hmm. Would you rather that? Or how many times did you hear about missions getting kanked? Like, sorry, we want to help you, but we can't. It's too dangerous. And it's just that a little bit too that. sandy or whatever. But you have yeah. somebody. That's a great point, Kate. Like, if you have a target down. To me, this entire thing goes on proficiency. I think it's a great idea, just like Tesla. Tesla is a great idea. They're autonomous cars and all that. Can you be proficient? Are you going to continue to run into kids? Like, I feel like that is where you have to draw the line. How proficient are these? Here's why I think it doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, Blackhawks are mainly used for troop transport. So whether you eliminate the the pilots, you're still going to have bodies in there. So what is it? What difference does it make if you eliminate the pilots? Well, these ones, it sounds like, are just going to be for dumping supplies off. So, like, yeah. they'll be just okay. picking up stuff and dropping it off. Is, All right. I if, think it's kind of like those Amazon drones. It's basically okay. like a big-ass Amazon drone, right. really, is what they're going to If it's strictly for, it. like, supplies and stuff, okay, I got it. Yeah, that's but, what it is. Yeah. All right. Well, then I'm yeah. more in on it. I think it's a great invention. Yeah. I think anytime you can have, if you have troops in, content, or troops in contact and you could drop it down, I feel like that's great. So, thumbs up, thumbs down on the unmanned or womaned helicopter. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I like uh, it. Gonna, thumbs up. Cons, you could do a mix of both. Yeah, I'm like thumbs in the middle. All right. in I think middle. We're two, we're two okay. and a half. I yeah. think that counts as two and a half thumbs up there. All right, let's move on to the next one. What's the next one, Kate? All right, we got Alice by Aviation, a totally electric commuter airplane. The mm-hmm. aviation industry, big producer of carbon emissions. One way to solve that, run an aircraft on electric power, utilizing them for just short hops. That's what aviation plans to do with a plane called Alice. 8,000 pounds of batteries in a belly of a That's commuter a lot aircraft. Of batteries. Gives it two motors. But you think if it's just doing short hops, people just carry on only, no luggage, whatever. Um, two motors. It made its first flight in September. Scrant but successful eight minutes in the air. Someday, as battery tech improves, the company hopes it can carry nine passengers about 200 miles or so. I'm, you know, you know yeah. who you, needs to use these? Celebrities. Dave. Like yes, Kylie Jenner, I know. like I know, where people yeah. get so pissed that they fly across town in a plane. This that saves yeah. this problem. Yeah, there you go. Get them all. This is an invention for the riches, essentially. Yeah. How do you guys feel about electric vehicles in general? I feel great about them. I think that once that technology improves, like Elon Musk, they re- like the one that they did this weekend. I feel like could save the United States a shit ton of money. The electric semi truck that has the ability to go like. Uh, 500 miles or something like that on a single load and they could load it up in the same speed like overnight they can load up the battery again to go if you have semi trucks that are able to they could pull the same normal load as this diesel powered semi truck i feel like that changes the game for so much stuff including fuel cost because that's a big part of inflation with diesel fuel costing five dollars six dollars a gallon in a lot of parts in the country i feel like it could be a big benefit for inflation mm-hmm. I just I forget to charge my phone all the time. That's what yeah. I know. I'd be stranded everywhere, dude. I wonder if they could add solar panels on the top of these trucks to continuously kind of charge them again. Yeah. Like while they're going to increase it. I'm sure somebody else way smarter than me has already figured that out. Uh, We're like, what if we build them out of mushrooms and if they crash, they just become part of the landscape? mm Mm-hmm. Something to think about. Exactly. So the electric plane, up or down? I'm going uh, no, it's for rich people. Boo. No, I'm going. I'm Fuck going. I'm, no, no, I'll go. I'll go up as well. Because uh, to okay. your point, chaps, I think you know, that's where I think electric vehicles are good. If you're just tooling around your own town, I still don't think we're there yet on the technology for any sort of right. long distance. In Kansas Dream a- World, he has a little. Uh, Ten years from now, he's wealth, super wealthy. Has a little electric plane. He takes up to West Point for games. Hundred <laughs> percent. Or just <laughs> rides in that electric helicopter and somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody drops if they, him off. <laughs> if they did that with Uber, it would be incredible. Like if you can yeah. get into an Uber in an autonomous car and you don't have to talk to the driver or deal with their stinky feet and bo. <laughs> I feel like that would be fantastic. What is yeah. worse? All right, ready? What is worse when you get an Uber? and they're playing crappy music really loud, or when they want to talk to you? When they want to talk. I say talk, because I can put my headphones in and be fine there. The worst part about very much New York, New Jersey area, the people that are driving the taxis, they constantly hit the brake just a little bit, even when you're on like the (laughs) highway and there's nobody in front. So you're sitting in the back just constantly going Oh yeah. Oh, I fucking hate it. why are we doing that? Why? Uh, because they've got 
like driver PTSD probably from New York probably, City. Yeah. They're probably yeah. just yeah. constantly seeing crashes in front of them. I imagine every them. taxi driver that the ones that go from Newark into the city like over and over again. I don't know how you do it, man. Like that yeah. job is tougher than the U.S. Marines for sure. <laughs> Amen. Oh, for sure. Sign of, speaking of cars, I, at the hiking spot this weekend, I pissed in a coffee cup in my front seat. Oh. Uh, with a lot of people around. Little coffee cup? Or are we talking venti? It came right to the cusp. I oh. said, oh, oh. oh we're right now. I had my whole ass and put it Hey, Cash, hand me one of them diapers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was tough going. And then I dump it out of the... Mama's open, got the blue line that <laughs> indicates wetness. I dumped it out the door real quick, and then I immediately forgot, hopped out. It was already in, like a muddy spot. I hopped out to get him out, and I hopped right in my pee mud. Oh, my gosh. If I had an electric car, we wouldn't be in that predicament. Yeah. Uh, I, that, I mean, that would it bring have been down dead the pee mud highway. like so much. Pima would be a lot mm-hmm. less. It might even make it extinct, some say. Great story. About Eradicate pee. pink uh, pee mud. Uh, I'm all on board for this next one. Electronic bag tags by Alaska Airlines. Believe it or not, some travelers do still check bags. What the fuck does that mean? Yeah. I mean, I do. I check. check in bags if you can avoid it at any cost. Yes. Yes. Is so I I will go without a hoodie or a shirt. I'll just we- I'd rather wear the same clothes twice than check it because it just takes so long. But dude, it's flying so with a toddler, you have to bring your whole you life to. with you, dude. Right. Yeah. And I have this massive have fucking thing. It sucks. Now. And flyers who can get an electronic bag tag from Alaska Airlines, um, they can use their mobile phone to create a luggage tag. So up to 24 hours before your flight. I, I don't understand this one. Yeah, this one's a thumbs down for <laughs> okay, me. They what? essentially invented Apple AirTags is what they did. Like, yeah. And you don't have to buy it. Why would you buy it? This one only works with Alaska Airlines. Why the fuck would you invest in that? Huge thumb down for me. How, yeah. how oh, this okay, make- I get it, I get it, I get it. What, so what? your bag has the little Scooby-Doo bonnet somewhere, and your phone has the little skippity bit, and you get to the airport, and you just say you're flying Alaska Airlines, you don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to weigh shit. You don't have to do nothing. You just toss your bag on this thing and say, suck it in, mama. I do kind of like that. I but, do kind of like so that. So that's cool. My guess, and then it tracks it. My guess is, though, you still probably have to bring it up to the counter because they're going to want to weigh it because they don't want to have people doing the, this and, you know, dropping off a 100-pound bag. My guess is they just have a – you do have to put it on a weight. If it makes a beep, somebody comes over to you and is like, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But if not – Beep, you're good. Send it through. That and if you're doing cool. this, if you travel enough to get this little tag, you know exactly how much your bag has to be. Yeah. Like, and you don't you don't want to deal with that shit whenever you get to the airport either. So I like this that. thumbs up or thumbs down? I'm thumbs I, down. I can see that becoming more of a thing. This one I'm go I'm not sure because I feel I like, like the that direction could it's happen. going. I like the yeah. directions. I like yeah. that the airlines are, are trying to think of ways to make flying less cumbersome. So I do I like think this that. This is good initiative. Okay, judgment. Yeah. Okay. Currently, currently. So last one, Kate. James Webb Telescope. So mm-hmm. NASA's James Webb Telescope, after more than two decades and nine point seven billion in the making, it launched on December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. Since February of this year, when it first started imaging, employing a mirror and aperture nearly three times larger in radius than its predecessor, the Hubble. Huge, brilliant, vibrant images have been coming back to us. And I remember when they, we got the first ones, everyone was like, whoa, holy shit. It's like a stoner's dream, these images. It's like my binder in sixth grade. When Remember those, like, binders yes. had those crazy exactly outer space about. scenes in the no, 90s? The, tra- the trapper keepers. It was like a trapper keeper, like a super outer space trapper keeper that I had. It can peer 13 billion years back in time at ancient galaxies still in their nursery. It can peek at exoplanets, seeking them directly where astronomers would have once had to reconstruct meager traces. It can teach us about how stars and galaxies came together from primordial matter, something only the Hubble could glimpse. Uh, That's fucking cool as hell. Again. I don't, I don't, how do you look? I understand like light years and things like, I don't understand it, but I get the concept (laughs) where you see it years later. 13 billion years i thought the big bang happened 5.4 billion years ago isn't that what we used to be taught Something how could like you that. go how could you go past the big bang is the big bang only our like universe or our solar system Maybe. I don't, or is it everything like how Wait. could it be basically if- so <laughs> we're, hear me out i knew this is where this is gonna go light takes time to travel right mm-hmm. and those so you don't measure them in distance so much as you measure the distance by how long it takes the light to get to the telescope. 
So it's essentially, they have figured out that those stars that it can see are 13 billion light years away. And so the light has only just now reached us 13 billion years later. So that means we're seeing it as it was 13 billion years ago, if that makes sense. It doesn't, I understand okay. what you're saying, but it absolutely <laughs> makes no sense in my yeah. brain at all. Oh, yeah, because, no, no. Because think about it. We feel like Babe Ruth lived just a whole long time ago, and mm -hmm. he was born in 1895. Yeah. So it's hard to comprehend what was happening in the 1800s. Like for me, like in my brain, yeah. going back 13 billion years, like 2,000 <clears throat> years to when Jesus was alive, like that time period. If you had 2,000, two I can't. Even I remember in years. California, I went to see the Redwoods and they had this one big tree cut down with all the rings. And they were like, this ring right here, because, you know, you count the rings of each year. This ring right here is the year that Jesus was whatever. This ring right here was the well, year that Spartans cool. did whatever. And it was, you could touch something that was there when these things happened and, in and ancient living. times. Yeah, and yeah really cool. Yeah, but it's hard. you're right. It's hard to imagine, especially I, in America when our history our yeah. colonial history is so short and you're like, whoa. Yeah, you think shit. like back in, and that was only like 300, 400, 300 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's fucking, pretty new. Yeah, still pretty baby. And that's like the foundation. 13 billion years before that, like 200, 200 years doesn't even make a glimpse of that. Yeah, see, we're just in our terrible twos right now is all. We'll yeah. get over it. It's a phase. Yeah, we'll get over we'll it. We'll pass fine. through. All yeah. right, let's move on. Oh, we're doing thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm doing big thumbs up. Uh, anything with cool images you can put on a trapper keeper. Hell yeah. I'm doing I'm doing thumbs up simply for the fact that 13 billion years is a thing. Like I yeah. don't even a billion dollars is hard to comprehend. Like how much money a billion dollars really is? Mhm. Mm Nuts. Uh, All right, let's speaking move. of, it's not on the list today, but uh, the DOD, it's nothing to them. They can't account for 60% of their budget in the latest audit. Yeah, LOL. I saw that. That's a How big budget. How unsurprising was that? We can see 13 billion years back, but we don't know where our tax money is going ever. <laughs> wow. I want to look at what the DOD defense budget was in 2021. Let's look it up real quick. I bet quick. it's in oh, the trillions. Ha -ha. It's close to a trillion. It's $801 billion. Dollars. Well, they can't account for 60% of it. Classic. That's, that's Dar DARPA, help us. Help. That's, hmm. I mean, I think the world food uh, industry said that they could eradicate hunger in the world for $4.5 billion. We're due $800 billion in just defense. Fucking nuts, though. Uh, what's also nuts is round number two. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of your challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills. This is something that my therapist, and I've been using it, BetterHelp does really well. Because with somebody like me that has my background, and I'm sure a lot of you listening to, like if you've been in intensive combat, most therapists or a lot of therapists will act like that is the the linchpin of every single one of your issues. I like that I went to BetterHelp and they went through essentially my whole life and identified other things that were triggers for me or that were problematic for me or that I was having difficulty go through. They teach you coping skills. They teach you all kinds of stuff that makes life a little bit easier, a little bit more comfortable, or just lets you know that you're not alone, that you have somebody to talk to and you can get things off your chest without judgment or fear that something's, there's going to be a reprisal. All of that thing, all of those things are great, and you can get them with BetterHelp. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% of the time. Plus, it's affordable. My wife, for example, she has her master's degree in psychology, and she uses BetterHelp and really enjoys it and is really disappointed when we go to Chicago that she'll have to find a different person. That's how much she loves it. Just fill out the brief questionnaire to match with the therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime it couldn't be simpler. There's no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash zero. That's better, H-E-L-P, betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash zero. Kate, okay, walk us through that shit. All right. This comes to us from historicmysteries.com. God damn it, chaps. Okay. <laughs> well, there is many well, different... Well, well, what edible did you take this weekend? Uh, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> You're on historicmysteries.com. Yeah. 
But this me. was Saturday night. I was like, oh, whoa. A couple whistle pigs in. Pop yeah, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. I was just laying there like, this shit is fucking nuts. Yeah. All right. Well, throughout history and right up to the present day, drugs have been given to soldiers who are encouraged to take them. Caffeine was popular during the Civil War, and alcohol has been used by militaries across the globe to relax soldiers. Uh, hey, you're about to head over this berm. It's going to be fine. Have a shot. Have I a feel like what you did in World War One and World War Two, if you didn't have a little cocaine, you weren't getting through that shit. That's right. In World War One, cocaine was widely distributed to the mm-hmm. British Army. World War II saw a trend of militaries testing and prescribing crystal meth to their soldiers to make them super soldiers. They no longer needed to sleep or eat food and had boundless energy until they're leaving out the massive crash part. The Nazis <laughs> created their own compound called DIX Dix, which combined methamphetamine, <laughs> cocaine, and oxycodone. I mean, that they were riding that Dix so hard. scary. Yeah, so that's scary. like the that's like the drug version of a Long Island iced tea. Yeah, like, well, I remember yes. hearing just everything mixed, or the yeah. Seven Horsemen, or whatever. During training, they were talking about in Iraq. Sometimes the the bad what do you call them? The enemy, the bad guys, would be yeah. so drugged up. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Al-Qaeda. bad guys. Bad guys, I think, was the official term. The bad guys, they'd be so drugged up that you could like nothing affected them. They just kept going, like a right. raccoon with rabies, kind of just we, PCP go- effect. Yeah, PCP we've, effect. We've yeah. encountered that throughout uh, more recent history. Like when we fought everybody in Somalia, they were doing the same thing. They were high on whatever that drug was or plant. It's same, same, same effect. So it was like never just trust that somebody's down because they could pop right back up. Blah, blah. Right. Anyway, the British Royal Air Force, the Finnish Army, and the American military began using and abusing meth. Many did not know the strength of the medications or mind-altering effects and addictive qualities. The power and risks of meth were on full display in 1944 through one man, Amo Koinunen. Amo Koinunen was a corporal in the Finnish Army during World War II. Buck, I just need to say, buckle the fuck up. Okay. Because this, this story keeps getting crazier and crazier and crazier as it goes on. Okay. So Amu Koinunen was a corporal in the Finnish Army during World War II. Fin- I didn't know this. Finland was an ally of Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. What? Those mm-hmm. sons of bitches. Mm-hmm. And had many battles against the Soviet Union throughout the war. And we were kind of allies with Soviet Union. Koinunen was the first documented case of a soldier overdosing on meth in combat. A known effect of meth is increased energy, focus, and reduction in fatigue. During World War II, the co- combat was like long and constant, like a battle would go for months of intense, crazy shit. So people were worn down physically and mentally, bringing morale down. Well, meth solved all those problems. Exhausted soldiers on the brinks of collapse would take one or two Pertivin pills and be energized and excited to return to battle. So that's Pilots. part of in uh, pills. On it, it says one ccm or just 0. 0.05 gram or one five grams. But on the actual box, it says methamphetamine, like right yeah. on top. Yeah. Pilots and soldiers were strongly encouraged to take the energy pills made of meth and cocaine. While it was never recommended in the U.S., military personnel could buy meth without regulation. Nuts. A low, uh, low to moderate doses, crystal meth causes elevated moods, alertness, energy focus. Redu- I swear we're not pro meth on this show, but it does no, sound pretty right? sick. It does sound fucking uh, awesome. At yeah. chronic or high doses, meth can cause seizures, inc- psychosis, violent behavior, and mood swings. We're about to see that happen. Okay. So now that the Jacksonville, Florida scene has been set, let's see why <laughs> we're talking about this today. Um, he and the other Finnish soldiers were assigned to ski patrol on March 18, 1944, a long-distance patrol isolated in harsh environments with an emphasis on survival. Three days into their patrol, they were attacked by the Soviets. In an attempt to escape with their lives, the Finnish soldiers followed Koinunen through winter forests. Each of the men in the patrol had different supplies, and he had the entire patrol's supply of Pertivin. He had 30 meth cocaine pills in his pocket for the whole yeah. squad. He started to become tired and the Soviet soldiers kept pursuing them and Koi, 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 Koi Vun, he decided to pop a pill. He could not stop to open the bottle and his thick mittens prevented him from grabbing a single pill. In desperation, he emptied the entire bottle into his mouth. Good oh. initiative, bad judgment, big time. It is unknown why the overdose of pills did not cause his heart to stop. He just had that dog in him. Right. But what happened was bizarre. 
He had increased energy but was delirious, and at some uh, point... Uh, you think? He became unconscious. He woke up the next morning to find himself 62 miles away from where he started. <laughs> so this guy blacked out on coke right. and skied 62 He's miles. fucking and had skiing. No- how was your weekend up at the ski lodge, Cons? Where you do go 62 miles? What are those beers called after skiing? Yeah. Apri um, ski- beer? Apri ski. Yeah, that's what he, he needs a big one of those. But you ever wake up like I've woken up? I once woke up on a couch in West Virginia with a bad case of the Sunday scaries. Mm-hmm. The last place I had been was Indiana, Pennsylvania. And I yeah. said, uh oh. Um, so I Fell get it. Fell asleep in the back of the truck. You can't leave the rest of that out. Right, yes. It happens from time to time. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> but to wake up 62 miles away, probably in the snow, none of your buddies are around, um, that has oh, to be a Sunday He was by himself. Thing. He was yeah, 100% he was alone. by himself. <laughs> well, I'm sure no one could keep up with it. Right. <laughs> um, he then discovered a small... <laughs> I wish we, like, now we have helmet cams. I wish this yeah. dude had a GoPro on. Where yeah. he's like, oh, oh, I got mittens on. I guess I can't take them off for two seconds yeah. to open this bottle. He discovered a small wooden cabin in the woods, went inside, lit a fire, and went to sleep, only to wake up to a massive fire. He had inadvertently set fire to his shelter... Instead of leaving the burning cabin, he scooched back a little bit and went to sleep until the cabin collapsed. <laughs> so that's how hard the crash was afterwards. He was like, that's oh, like a, shit. Oh, that's how you it. wake up after a long night or whatever. You're like, oh, that's a tomorrow problem. I'm yeah. just not mm-hmm. dealing with that right now. <laughs> but wait, there's more. He then yeah. just took the North Star for the light from another cabin. Buddy, that cabin's pretty high up, isn't it? And he tried to ski towards it. Imagine trying to ski to the moon. I love it. <laughs> Traveling blindly until he stumbled across an abandoned German camp. As he was leaving, he skied over a landmine which detonated because the Nazis had set up booby booby traps all over the place, and so he was discovered. After he realized the Nazis from the camp would never come rescue him, still high on meth, he got up and continued to ski away. (laughs) Finnish soldiers eventually found him lying in the snow, talking nonstop and confused. When he went to the hospital, another man set off a hidden landmine. The rescue party couldn't take both men at the same time, so they said, wait here, we'll be back. A few days later, he was still alive, taken to the hospital in terrible condition. The you doctors, don't say. They were stunned he was still alive and talking. When he was found, he weighed 90, 94 pounds because the meth suppressed his appetite and destroyed the, the need for food. Um, his foot was completely ruined, yet this man had come from weeks of exposure and was still alive and conscious. He said he was hallucinating almost the entire time and didn't know where he was when he crawled into a ditch. He later spoke about his drug fueled trip and recalled how he was attacked by a wolverine and woke up to find himself violently <laughs> stabbing a tree. Miraculously, I just pictured like the Germans were about to take him and they were like, nah. Nah, we'll right. leave my We don't want to fuck with that guy. Madison Cawthorn would like the stab in the tree part, though. Yeah, he... Shockingly, miraculously, Quinnenden recovered, returned to Finland, had a family. His son, Micah, said his father didn't talk about what happened very often. However, in 1977, when a local newspaper held a contest asking soldiers to submit stories from the war, he wrote a small memoir. He's like, ah, uh, we win. <laughs> Nobody. This next part is important. His story came in second place. What the I need fuck to hear, happened? All right. I need to hear first place. What I mean, you got attacked by a wolverine, you're stabbing a tree, you took 30 pills of meth, you're up for weeks, you you skied 62 miles in one night. That's so far. Like, so far. Mm-hmm. I got to know what first place is. I'm going to have to look that up. I'm going to look it up, too. Yeah, Maybe we'll come back wild. next week with that story. Listen, Nuts. I just think, like, this reminds me, like, you walk around Manhattan, and unfortunately, you know, you will always see homeless people, and a lot of times... They'll be acting extremely strange. And I can remember when I was much younger and I was in the city with my parents or something. And I asked my dad, like, what's going on? Like, why is that person acting like that? He's like, drugs. And I was like, oh, yeah, it makes, makes sense. You know, don't do drugs. Mm-hmm. Especially yeah. meth. I think meth is Because you're going to be skiing A1. 62 miles and fighting imaginary wolverines. I think yep. meth is A1 drug don't take, right? Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. They say that it, it the way it alters your brain is almost immediate and it's very very difficult to it can be done but it's very very difficult to turn back once you started going down that road it's really tough yeah not good Um, yikes all right let's do move on to round number three this is a big week for cons it's the biggest week i would say of his year it's army navy week you got to talk to the head football coach for the first time we've been doing the the podcast Mm -hmm. how was that that was great uh coach jeff 
Munkin mm -hmm. is not, uh, not very true. well respected in the college football world. I, I think he does a great job with the program, and it was just uh, very nice. I, I'm not sure why we just didn't think to have him before now, but we 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 got him, and he was a great uh, great interview. And uh, here it is. All right, joining us now on Zero Blog Thirty. I am very excited to be talking to this guest. It's a very big week, perhaps the perhaps the biggest week of the year. It is Army Navy Week, and we are joined now by Army's head coach, Coach Jeff Monk. And Coach, welcome to the show. Glad to be on with you. This is the biggest week of the year, no doubt about it. That's right. That's right. So let's uh, let's, we'll get into Army Navy for sure. But I want to talk to you a little bit about your your journey here uh, at Army. You're now in your your ninth season. You know, many folks have credited you, uh, deservedly so, in my opinion, with reviving the Army football program. You're now the second winningest coach of all time. There, when you think about Army football and where it stands in the pantheon of college football and its history, how does it feel to be part of that history in in the way that you are? It's just a, a tremendous source of pride for me personally to to be here and be a part of this program. There's there's so much history here. The the great players and coaches and teams that have been a part of this history, really incredible. So to to be able to join uh this team and and this institution as the coach is is really an honor and privilege for me. So um there's there's there are a lot of things we've got to continue to do to grow this program and and uh and push it forward and 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 create more history but um you know our, our guys here i'm proud of what they've done the last few years and being able to uh to really uh, cement their teams as we've gone through in the history of of army football and so i when i took this job i, I come from a coaching family mm -hmm. and one of my uncles um he, he said to my dad when when I took this job, he said, "Gosh, does he know all the coaches? Does he know the history of that place? What a what an incredible opportunity!" And I and I certainly did, and 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 I appreciate that, and 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 just feel honored and privileged to be here every day. Yeah, and we're honored and privileged uh, to have you. Certainly, you mentioned there are some things that you still want to do to, to to continue to move the the program forward. What are some of those things? Win more games. I mean, we we haven't we haven't won as many this year as as uh, I had hoped we would. And we've had, uh, you know, we've just been on the wrong end of some close games and credit the other teams. They beat us. We didn't make enough plays. We got to make those plays. That, that's kind of how we've built it here. We've we've been in close games. And early on, uh, my second year here, we lost 10 games, seven of them by seven points or less. And and what happened was we we, we really started to flip those games. The next year and in the years that followed, we've we've won more of those close games. So right. that that's you know that's that's just kind of where we've been this year um, and haven't won those close ones. And so find a way to to get over the hump again. And the margin for error here is zero. We've got to be really essentially perfect on our assignments and fundamentals to give ourselves a chance and. And that's that's what I credit our players for. They work really, really hard at those things, and and so we, we want to continue to improve and and give ourselves a a an opportunity each week to compete and have a chance to win the game. And and so that's a challenge, and and uh, you know that 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 will always be the challenge here. Right, right. And you know, you mentioned winning games. I think winning games in college football is is hard. I mean to go in every year and, and be competitive is, is a very big challenge. And, you know, we've had some success as a program. So how do you deal with the expectations that the fans, the alumni ha have come to enjoy um, from you and from our team? How do you deal with that on a yearly basis? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have to deal with, with the expectations of anybody else. I, I deal with my own expectations and nobody's got higher expectations for this program or this team than I do. Mm -hmm. So that to, to, to have high expectations as we do, we've got to maintain very high standards. And that's my job is to, to maintain the standards and help everybody that's a part of this program uh, adhere to the standard that, that it takes to be able to, to, to have an outstanding football program and team. Our expectations are to win every time we play. Right. And those right. are high standards. Very difficult to do that, as you said. College football is 
it's hard to win a game and it doesn't matter who you play. Uh, so if, if the expectation is you're going to give yourself a, an opportunity each week, regardless of who, who we play to win, then the standards need to meet those expectations. So that those are, those are all my responsibility and, and the responsibility of everybody in this program to, uh, to maintain that standard. And we've got good leadership. I, I like our players. Um, you know, they, they make, the biggest difference in, in our opportunity to win. They, they're the ones putting the work in. They're the ones that have to go make the plays. And, and certainly it's our job as coaches to position them and, and give them a chance schematically. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, you talk about standards and obviously the, the game has, has evolved over the, the course of many decades. I mean, the game now is very different than when coach Blake was, was Roman Mikey stadium. So how do you balance those standards with coaching at an academy and all the changes that we've seen across the board in college football the last five years or so? Regardless of the school, whether it's Army or any other school, I, th I think it's important to implement schemes that fit the personnel and, and fit the personality of the team. And, and that's what we try to do here. Um, I think if you watch Coach Blake's teams, uh, he certainly probably had that same philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he had some great teams. Uh, college football is different, but everybody's evolved, and and we have to. We've we've kind of moved from what we were doing twenty years ago, and even now nine years ago, to what we're doing now, uh, offensively, defensively, and in special teams. The way we train our players, the way we feed our players, um, the 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 just the this the details that that go unnoticed um right. how we practice the the uh the structure of practice what days we take off what we're doing in the off season there's a lot of things that that we have to do to evolve and and we need to continue to do that we've got to continue to evolve because it, it the landscape changes and and other coaches and other programs change and we got to change along with them somewhat to uh to to maintain our, our competitiveness but stay true to who we are and to the culture and the personality of this program and this institution yeah no absolutely and you definitely have done that very well in my opinion i've been fortunate enough to to be around the program you know and see workouts and just see the culture uh you know from a thirty thousand foot view certainly not as intimately as the players and coaches but i i think you've you and your staff have done an excellent job um with that you know, shifting gears now to, to Army Navy, the game uh, on Saturday. So everybody knows you spent some time at that that lower tier boat school, um, which you know only blemish on my resume. That's it. <laughs> you know, it's okay. You you you've seen the error of, the, of your ways, and you're at the right school uh, now. But how does that provide an advantage, or maybe it doesn't? But how does that help you going into this game, having having been at the the other school as well? Oh, I don't know that it makes a difference. Um, it, it, they're 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 a different team and a different staff and different players than were there when when I coached there. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a it's just such an intense rivalry. The competitiveness of this game, the the will to win on both sides is incredible. Uh, there's 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 an intensity in this game that's unrivaled in any other game I'm convinced of that I don't care if it's a Super Bowl or a conference championship or a national championship there can't be two teams that fight harder in a game than these two teams fight in this one yeah and I mean evident by if you look at the scores the last handful of years it hasn't you know been a been a blowout really it's always a, a really close game um and and do you do you think them and us, you know, playing similar style styles of football, does that lend itself to those close games and, and maybe each coaching staff knowing a little bit more than some of the other opponents that we might play through the year? Is that why it works out that it's always such a close game? I believe there there is something to the familiarity between the, the schools and the and the systems. I mean, you look at uh, just our games and the academy games in general, they are almost always just slug fests and and one score games and um and the other academies too when when navy played air force this year it was a 13 to 10 game 
uh, so many of them are low scoring and and just hard fought battles. But we um, you know, we we have had some really close games with them, and so just trying to come out on top and and hold them to as few points as possible has has really been the formula in these games for both them and for us uh, is playing great defense and 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 taking care of the ball. You know, mm-hmm. what what one turnover can do in a game like this is, I mean, it it, it can, can, can completely change the game. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it, going into the game, there's there's always so much, obviously, fanfare. And in the last, I guess, since 2016, we've had this sort of game within the game with the, the uniform reveals of, of each school. And you've been on record, I can remember during the COVID year when uh, that the other school out West was ducking us. And, you know, you said to, they would, you would play anywhere that they want to play. You'll line up in a parking lot uh, and play them. So along those same lines, I suspect you don't really care what your players are wearing. So long as they got a helmet, shoulder pads and a Jersey on. Uh, but do you um, enjoy the, the uniform reveals and, and the um, I guess that the fanfare, as I mentioned, that, that com- comes along with it. The, the thing I like most about the uniforms are the men and women that, that we represent when we wear those uniforms. That, that, that to me is what is special about the uniform, nothing else. The, all the other stuff is just all the other stuff and it doesn't have anything to do with winning or losing, nor does the color of the uniform or the, the uh, appeal of the uniform doesn't have anything to do with winning or losing, it, but to wear the, those uniforms in this game and represent those men and women is truly an honor. And, and that's what makes it so special. So I enjoy it from that standpoint, but beyond that, it doesn't make a hill of beans to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I think I, I suspect in talking to, to players that, that have played for you, they, they feel the same way. It's, it, you know, that certainly if the uniform looks cool, they're excited, uh, but I think they they take a lot of pride in, in representing the the folks who served in those units that we're honoring each each year, which is uh, I think a very cool part and probably for me the best part because you'll see on social media and talking about people how anyone who served in that unit gets really excited when their unit's being being featured. So uh, it, it really is special from that standpoint. I agree. Um, and you know, and I think that's that's part of what makes th- this game the, the the best rivalry. In all sports, I, I think a lot of people will argue that it is uh, the, the best rivalry in, in sports. And I think a lot of people have their reasons why, you know, it's two great schools, two great institutions. Uh, the, the kids that are on the teams are are great young men and they're going to go on and, and serve their country, which I think is admirable. But is there something that you could share with us that maybe most folks wouldn't know as to why this game is so special? I've I've always thought that this game is is special and is the best rivalry in sports because each of the competitors that's out there playing and uh, and having it out the twenty two guys that are on the field all their teammates on the sideline and all their classmates that sit up in the stands all of those young men and women have made a pledge of commitment to serve our nation and there are millions of people that watch that game there's. I don't know, 60, 70,000 people that, that, that pay a lot of money to have a ticket to come to that game and watch it. And it's a spectacle. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most watched college football games of the year, every year. But all, all, all the people that watch are spectators. Mm-hmm. And most of them, so, many of them are men and women who represent the army who watch from all over the world. Certainly, certainly them, the, the teams out there on the field are representing our men and women and like our men and women who serve currently at our, our men and women who have served our veterans. Each of these young men and women have made a, a pledge of commitment to serve our nation and perhaps pay the ultimate price for everybody else that's watching. There's no other game like that. Mm-hmm. And and that makes it really special, and I think is just a reason that we should honor this game, and and why we should we should this game is sacred. It's America's game. They call it America's game, but it really is. 
it's 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 the next generation of leaders in our military that are out there fighting their butts off for four hours on a Saturday afternoon in December to represent men and women all over the world who are putting themselves in harm's way at that very moment. So um, it's a special rivalry, and I don't think there's any any other rivalry like it. Well, well, you're not going to get an argument from me on that. And, and, you know, each year with each of your teams, I will notice so many of your players that I think to myself, I'd be happy to share Foxhole with that, with that young man right there. Um, so, you know, I credit you for creating that culture that produces these types of players and, and more importantly, these types of leaders. Uh, do you have a, a favorite army Navy memory to date? Hmm. All, all of the games that we won are great memories mm -hmm. uh, for sure. So the 16 game, when, when we broke the streak, um, to, to win in the snow uh, and how it came down to the very end in that game, the, uh, the 18 game, which, which uh, I thought our guys just played a great football game. Uh, and then the pandemic year here in 20, when, I mean, we didn't know if we would have a season, right. The, uh, you know, all of the things that football teams and, and football players were going through that year. And certainly our guys, the isolation and the, you know, the, the the protocols with testing and I mean that was a hard year but mm -hmm. you know, our guys persevered through that I was so proud of those guys they persevered persevered through all that and a lot of people talked about the pandemic year and I think uh it, it, there it's not an excuse it was a reason that that there were a lot of issues with with people missing games and 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 those kinds of it, just all the things that went with it but our guys found a way they persevered through that and I was really proud of them and to recapture the commander chiefs trophy that year was special so um you know just I think all the games that we won are all great memories and certainly on the other side when when we've lost that game it is there's there's the agony of defeat and it is it is uh it is an agony that you feel for an entire year until you have a chance to play it again Absolutely. So, I mean, you, you have to be just chomping at the bit then given last year's result to, to go into the game this Saturday. Our players are excited to play and and, and we all are uh, competitive people are that way. They can't wait for the next opportunity, but this is such a, a big game and such a big rivalry. And we are, so, we were and continue to be sorely disappointed about uh, the outcome of last year's game that we want a chance to redeem ourselves, but you know, last year's game doesn't have anything to do with this year's game. It's going to be this team playing their team and and uh, and the best team on uh, on Saturday, December the 10th, is is going to be the winner. So hopefully we'll play well enough to to be the victor. Absolutely. I agree with you. And, and maybe that's just a, a great spot to wrap up. So I'll leave you with this. Is there any message that you'd like to to convey to all the former players, graduates, uh, you know, soldiers, uh, past and present out there that are going to be watching the game on Saturday? I speak for our team when I say that that we are incredibly proud to represent all of those men and women. Uh, our men and women that serve, that are all over the world right now, that are readying themselves uh, for, for that call when it comes, for the long gray line of graduates, the Army Football Brotherhood, uh, and Everybody that's represented by someone in the Army or West Point, and and that that's millions of people, and it is just a privilege for us and an honor for us to represent all of them, and uh, hopefully on Saturday we'll play a game that they can all be proud of, and and uh, and we'll be proud to say that 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 uh, Army is their team, and so we're gonna be striving for that on Saturday. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope uh, all those people we represent will have a chance to watch and be cheering and yelling loud and uh, yell loud enough we can hear you all the way in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Coach. I think it's going to be a W for us. Uh, clearly, I'm biased, uh, but I, I believe we have the the team and, and the coaches uh, capable of getting that win for us. So, Coach, I wish you all the luck on Saturday to you, your staff, your players, um, everybody uh, in the halls of Army football there, to include Jen Guzman. Uh, one of my favorite people. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, coach, thank you so much 
for for joining the show. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, and best of luck and beat Navy. Thanks, Connor. It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure and beat Navy. Shout out to the old West Point coach for taking some time during the busiest mm -hmm. week for them. We're looking forward to it. We're going to be down at River North in the Philly area. No, uh, that's what? Chicago's bar. We're going to be oh. at Barstool Sansom <laughs> oh. Street in Philadelphia. Yeah, that'd be a long it's trip from Chicago. Right near the heart of Center oh. City, um, 8 to 10 p.m. on Friday night. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think we have some merch we're giving out. We're going to be just hanging out with everybody. Hopefully, I'm going to hit up the Flyers Warriors again and see if they want to come out and see if anybody else wants to come. But I'd love to meet some of you if you're in the Philly area. And then Saturday, we have a big footprint. Barstool itself has a big footprint at the game. Dave, Big Cat, everybody's going to be there. They're doing the college football show from there, which with Army-Navy is always awesome. Mm -hmm. So, And we yep. love meeting all the different cadets and walking around yep. and talking oh, to them. Oh, it's the best. Like that. I fucking love yeah, it. Yeah, it's the absolute best, so they can ask us where Dave and Dan are 100 times. <laughs> that, <laughs> that'll be great. Uh, let's move on to save rounds and alibis. Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Manscaped. Tis the season for clean balls. Fa la 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 la. From stocking stuffers to white elephants, Manscaped products are the top of every wish list. Help the men in your life go from eggnog to nice hog talking dicks, folks, this December by going to manscaped.com. Use the promo code ZERO for 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped is a one-stop shop for all your holiday needs. They have the perfect gift in the Platinum Package 4.0 plus loads of little presents. Perfect for stocking stuffers. It includes the lawnmower 4.0, the weed whacker, the two-in-one shampoo, conditioner, you got body wash, deodorant, crop preserver, crop reviver, and the travel bag and Manscaped boxers to go along with it. You're also going to get another great gift this season, which is the Shears 2.0. They have their full kit for nail clippers and scissors and tweezers and a file for the traveling man because you don't want to have a little bit of sharp spots on your cuticles or your nails with a little snag, fellas, because nobody likes that. Ladies don't like that. They also have the Preserve Cologne that brings a light, breezy, woodsy feel and gives you that that fresh tree scent even after the holidays are over. I love it. My balls smell great. My dick smells great. If you want your dick and balls to smell like my dick and balls, go to Manscaped and get 20% off free shipping with the code zero at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the promo code zero manscaped for a perfect gift. That will be holidays biggest hit. Nick is in the office and there's a lot of construction going on, so he's not going to do one today. He just wants to remind you to subscribe to the YouTube. Cons, what about you, pal? Yeah, obviously a uh, huge week. We got great shirts uh, for Army out there in the same vein as the, the Rocky poster. Very cool design mm -hmm. uh, from the, the cadets uh, at West Point that designed that one. Um, and speaking of, of merch, I, I don't think I asked. I, I wrote two blogs and gave my thoughts on each team's uniform for the game. What were your guys' thoughts? I just I, want everyone to have a good time. I like straight up do not care. <laughs> I, don't right, know what I, there. I, I I I like the mud splatter of like you know going off what the tanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being like that, like I like the small details like that. I do like hearing the stories behind each uniform and hearing mm -hmm. like the unique little things. And so I like both. Okay. I don't know. I'm a dork. I just no, love I the day. It's just I a fun time. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. I like armies better this year. I think uh, that. It's a very clean design. It almost kind of looks like uh, an alternate uniform for the Wyoming Cowboys, who will also mm -hmm. be playing in the Barstool Bowl this year. Yeah. I really – and I liked Armies this year. Um, I think the only uniform that is really – I thought was better than the Armies uniform might have been the Blue Angel year. Like okay. uh, the rest of them, I think Army is – well, one, it's Nike versus Under Armour. So mm -hmm. that's like a big difference. So yeah. um, I think theirs was better. Um, what? Anything else, Cons? Uh, no, I have a few more. Oh, actually, yes. When is that um, PB Abate workout of the day? I did it on Saturday. Oh, I didn't. we didn't hear anything about it. How did it go? I wanted, like, I read the Abate story, and I, I wanted to do it alone. And I didn't want okay. to, like... It was something that I wanted to really concentrate on and not do it for content, and it was, it was great. Okay. Awesome. And for the record, you ran. Yeah, I did. I, I did <laughs> time myself. It took me 10 minutes and 15 seconds to get through the first mile, 
Mm-hmm. And just because I was taking it easy, That's I knew I, good. I knew I had that. a super long day ahead of me, and I hadn't done cleans in a long time. Mm. So I knew that that was gonna break me the fuck off. So I took it real slow. After doing the first set of cleans, and then going out and run the 800 was tough. And then you come back and do it again, and then you close out with a mile. And it was it was the second mile. I ended up doing nine minutes and 15 seconds. So I was picking it up, which is still drastically slower than I used to be but I'm a 40 year old man who hasn't done shit in a long time so I feel like I did okay like it was hard. <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. uh, Kate anything for you um no I don't think so I thought this isn't just an interesting note um, so 20 people from multiple states said they were wounded by a specific type of sig sour pistol um, the lawsuit says there have been over a hundred incidents where the p320 has just gone off in their holsters hitting them in the legs and feet, and Yikes. thankfully not killing anybody or anybody else. But if you have one of those, because I know a lot of listeners um, carry it enough, so it's the P320 six hour. Update your personal safety Update safety your personal safety brief. Yeah, I saw that, and I thought I almost want to text. I know I have family members who I kind of want to text and be like, just check real quick and see. Um, but I guess mostly law enforcement have those, but you never know. Um, other than that, that's not really a fun, safe round, but I just thought, why not? Yeah, I mean, um, weapon safety, paramount. Weapon safety. Do I have anything else? No. I don't. Big time yak coming up on Thursday. A fun yak for you. A fun yak? Yeah, Dr. Oz the Mentalist. is. They booked him to come in again because of, so last time he guessed this big thing from me and my brain, and I still don't know how he did it. It was impressive. Not TV Dr. Oz. Different Dr. Oz. Di- different Dr. Oz. Um God, I don't even remember what I did on Saturday. Has anyone else's brain just been jelly lately? Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. couldn't, if you right now put a, <laughs> I couldn't tell Six you what hour. I did Saturday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's a little specific. <laughs> All right, that's it for me. Okay. All right. Um, last night I was watching a Jeopardy getting back caught up, and I thought of a good Marine joke. You guys ready? Yes. What are yes. Marines' favorite ancient gods? It's from, I'll give you a hint. It's from Egypt. Denial? No. No. Ra. <laughs> oh, Ra. Yeah. I thought of one that's not military related the other what? day. I almost tweeted it, and then I was like, no. What is it? Um, hey, are you a dentist? Because I want to know how that oral be. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah. Because I got a new oral B toothbrush. Uh, it's electric, made me think. Yeah, that's okay. a fancy toothbrush. Is it? You do that because of the adult braces? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's getting real dodgy in there. A lot of extra nook knacks on there, so. Oh, mm-hmm. chaps. But you're talking normal with it now. Yeah, you sound normal. I'm you trying to. You can't notice them, really, honest to God. I feel like not I got like those scary you, Busey teeth. Not when you try to hide it from me and cons in Colorado, <laughs> where you're talking strange. We're like, what's going on? Yes, like, I forgot about that. And you're like, oh, uh, I got adult braces. And my mouth was bleeding. <laughs> like they're yes. cutting into my gums. Yeah, because I got a knockoff brand. Turns a out you of don't years. get braces from Amazon. No, <laughs> not, don't not do it, folks. Job. Do go through your dentist like I did this time. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. Chaps, did you want to talk about uh, our, our colleague, Coach Prime? Oh, yeah. I, there was a thing about Coach Prime. Because Deion Sanders, if you haven't heard, he moved on from Jackson State, and he is going to be the head coach at the University of Colorado, the Buffaloes. And he went and had his, after his team won their conference game, became conference champions again, he went out to Colorado for his introduction to the new team. And one of the things that he talked about there was that if you want to enter the portal, if you want to enter the transfer portal, go ahead, because I'm bringing my baggage with me, and it's Louis Vuitton. He's talking about his son and some of the other players from his school. He recruited the number one recruit in the nation last year to go there. There was a lot of people that had an issue with him telling the, the students that were currently on the 1-11 and Colorado Buffaloes that if they don't like the way that he's doing it, enter the transfer portal, because there are going to be plenty of players that are better that are going to come here. I fucking love that move you're one in 11 and you have somebody who's a hall of famer in football and he comes into your team you gotta up your level of play and if you don't want to be coached hard you don't want to have all that stuff going on get the fuck out and if you got a problem with it don't play for colorado you can transfer to any other school you don't have to wait like you used to and you can play the next year you want to move on from colorado fucking do it but prime is going to make colorado prime i utsa number one for me hmm. who also conference champions back to back and cons did you know this utsa has the fourth most wins in college football in the last two years I did not know that. 
Mm -hmm. The only other ones are all in the college football playoffs. Oh. Pretty good, pretty good. Do players from schools like UTSA ever go on to the NFL? Or is it only um, big name school? Wolin, who is probably going to get Defensive Rookie of the Year. He was a cornerback um, at UTSA. Uh, there's a first DeMarcus or Davenport who plays for the Saints. He was a first round pick. So they're they're getting better to start. They started when I was a freshman there. That was the first year that they had a college football team and they played like Southwest Louisiana Tech and shit like that for a little while. And now they're back to back conference USA champions. Got to love that. That's a pretty yeah. big blow up. So yeah. I'm excited about that. I hate the Jacksonville Jaguars at this point. Just fucking disappoint me every day. Mm-hmm. I just I mean, I want to disavow, but I can't uh, because I'm tied to Jacksonville, just like meth. So uh, we'll see you next time. Sound the retreat.